But those who worked with Carol Lombard remember her best, a brave and cheerful trooper. A boundless spirit was infectious, dominated every cast. Ultimately, she became one of the leading actresses of her time. A star of the first magnitude, she had become the screen's top-notch comedienne. She never stopped working, never let misfortune drag her down. She and Clark Gable were married in 1939 and started what seemed Hollywood's happiest married life. Carol Lombard's last role was played in her country service. She went on tour to sell defense bonds. At Indianapolis, she spoke her last lines. Carol Lombard said farewell. It is the duty of each and all of us to, create, to contribute every ounce of energy and every dollar that we can possibly spare for the purchase of defense bonds, which will carry us to victory. Let us all sign a pledge to buy a bond in order that we may continue to lay us in the land that is free. And leaving you now, I want you all to join me in raising your hands and making the sign of victory. The V sign popularized by our famous alley across the sea, Winston Churchill. Heads and hands up, America. Let's give a rousing cheer that will be heard in Berlin and Tokyo. One freezing winter night, an airliner flying over Nevada went off its course, then crashed into this mountain. The wreck took 22 to their deaths, including Carol Lombard. A recovery party establishes its base and sets off on the long climb. The scene of the wreck is high above Las Vegas. Pack horses are taken in the hope that they may carry back the bodies of the victims. The searchers reach their goal, then the task of bringing back the dead. There were no survivors. Fifteen army pilots died here in one of aviation's worst disasters. Peggy Moran rides in style in the nation's capital. The popular Universal Starlet is on vacation here, but right now she's doing a little bit for Uncle Sam. Peggy's helping the defense stamp sale at Treasury House. I'd imagine that sales would spurt hereabouts with Peggy in charge, and yes sir, it doesn't take long. Here come the cash customers, including Max Cohen, manager of the Universal Exchange in Washington. They both know a good investment when they see one. The Secretary of the Treasury, Morgenthau, welcomes the British and American war medal men. He initiated their nationwide tour to promote war bond sales. I want to thank each of you from the bottom of my heart what you've done in helping to win the war. And in behalf of the Treasury Department, I also would like to thank you for the great assistance that you're giving us in this war bond effort. President Roosevelt receives winners of decorations for valor. The president extends White House hospitality, along with the First Lady and the British ambassador, to men who, having done their glorious bit, are now exhorting us to do ours by buying war bonds. There's a Philadelphia ovation for the party of allied war heroes who are touring the United States in behalf of the sale of war bonds. They ride in the scout cars. British and American medal men, men who have been decorated for exploits of heroism in war. Honor is paid to them for courage shown in air battle on high and in commando raids. And now the parade passes Independence Hall. A women's defense unit marches by as Philadelphia stages a pageant of fervent wartime patriotism. At Independence Hall, the war heroes see that venerable historic memento, Liberty Bell, shown to them by Mayor Samuels. Flag Day in Philadelphia, and it is also the United Nations Day. The city of William Penn and a great demonstration of wartime morale. And on Flag Day, they say it with flags. In 
Washington, D.C., your favorite stars are cast by Uncle Sam in a billion-dollar production. That's the goal in the September war bond drive led by the motion picture industry. Bing Crosby helped launch the Coast to Coast campaign. There's Jimmy Cagney, Abbott and Costello. At the Treasury Building, the mightiest bond-selling epic gets off to a banner start. The big-name stars draw crowds that remind observers of a presidential inauguration. Host to the silver screen contingent is Treasury Secretary Morgenthau. And now, customers, action, sell! The new slogan of the super salesman from Hollywood Studios. Stars over America, all doing their bit. How about you, movie fans? Thousands of Americans in hundreds of cities have inspected this Japanese suicide submarine which ran aground off the island of Oahu, Hawaii. The sub, our first trophy of the war with Japan, weighs over 20 tons, carried two torpedoes and a powerful suicide bomb within its hull. It's coming to this city soon, and the purchase of a war stamp will entitle you to see the submarine's inner mechanism. Secretary Knox, Mr. and Mrs. John L. Connor, Ted R. Gamble, and Captain Sam Jenkins, who commanded the hero cruiser Atlanta. A check for $61 million is presented to the Secretary of the Navy by Chairman Connor of the new Atlantic Cruiser Committee. In a campaign launched at the city of Atlanta, money was raised to provide a new ship to take the place of the cruiser sunk in a heroic fight while the American fleet was winning the great naval battle of Guadalcanal. Mr. Prime Minister, in opening the third war loan, I'm very happy to be able to sell you the first $100 bond. This is going to be a great example and inspiration to the 50 million Americans that we're going to ask to buy an extra $100 bond during our September drive. I take great pleasure in delivering this to you and thank you, sir. Mr. Secretary, I'm very glad indeed to come here today and it is a great pleasure to me to receive from your hand this, uh, the first bond of your great new victory alone. I uh, have often thought, Mr. Secretary, that you must be one of the bravest men in the world and that you ought to have the Congressional Medal and the Victoria Cross and all the other decorations of all the Allies for being able to lie down at night and sleep so calmly and quietly amid all these astronomical figures of modern finance. So far you have borne the great burden with success. Now, this is the fourth anniversary uh, of uh, British entry into the war. And uh, we certainly have a right to be extremely thankful that we are all in such good posture after these long periods of tribulation and peril. This loan undoubtedly will have the effect, if it is fully subscribed, of appreciably affecting the duration of the struggle. If it were to fail, it would entail a prolongation. Everyone, therefore, should give it their utmost support. <laughs>
I'm so glad you could come. Won't you come in? Come right in and sit down. Make yourselves comfortable. I wanted to take you back to a day in 1918. This seemed the best way of doing it. The date was November the 11th. Remember? Remember that day? The world was wild with joy. It was the day of peace, the day of victory. But do you remember the world on November the 10th, 1918, the day before the armistice? Do you realize that 26,000 men were killed in action on November the 10th, 1918? This boy was wounded on November the 10th, 1918, one day, one day before the war was over. Do you recognize him? He was one of the thousands of men who were killed or wounded on November the 10th, 1918, one day, one day before the war was over. Now, mind you, if the war had ended just one day sooner, this same boy, your boy, your brother, your father, or husband might have been holding his wife in his arms, might have been looking into the faces of his children. We all want this war to end sooner. But every day, every hour, every minute counts. A bullet takes only a split second to reach its objective. That objective might easily be someone you love. We can shorten this war. Our fighting men are doing their part on the war front. We can do ours on the home front. Just think of the saving in human lives if this war were to end just one day sooner. The third war loan is on now. This theater and movie theaters throughout the country are making it possible for you to shorten this war. Let your slogan now be, a bond for a life. The bond you purchase as you leave this theater may be the ticket home for someone you love. Remember, if you want them back, back them up. Let our money build a bridge across the Atlantic and the Pacific, over which our boys can come home to your arms and to mine sooner. Thank you. I'm for it, John, but I loaded up with war bonds in the last three drives. And I can't afford it this time. Heck, that box of mine in the bank is stuffed with bonds. I always went over the quarter. But this time, I just can't afford it. I'm sorry, I can't afford it. Hold on, Joe. There's something I want to say to you. Are you talking to me? Yeah. And I want to give it to you quick. You know, we've got a lot of boys and girls fighting this war for us, and they're doing a great job. Maybe too great, because you're beginning to feel good again. You think peace is just around the corner, so now you're going to go in there and buy yourself a nice new suit of clothes. Been a good guy up to now. Yeah, but you're quitting. Quitting, Joe, before the job is over. War factories haven't shut down. They're still working the clock around to turn out the stuff we need to win this war. And the Merchant Marine is still ducking torpedoes and bombs to get it there. The Army hasn't quit. The Navy hasn't quit, and neither have the Marines, or the girls. You're quitting right in the middle of the fight. Oh, listen now. You want to let those fellows and girls down. It's been a whole lot tougher for them than for you. Joe, what if they decided to let you down? What if they quit? What if they decided they couldn't afford any more? What if the boys who've been taking it for you suddenly said that they'd gone over their quota? They fought a battle last week, last month, last night that some other guy should take it for a change. For instance, you, Joe. The Nazis won't quit. The Japs won't quit. And you'd better not quit. That's what you can't afford. I never looked at it like that before. Well, maybe some other folks haven't either. But if we want to look those boys and girls in the eye when they come marching home, or if we want to look ourselves in the eye, we won't quit. Now, the fourth wall on driver's on. And nobody can afford to buy that extra suit or that extra dress or those unrationed shoes. But what's more important is that we can all afford to buy those bonds. Let's all back the attack.
Right returns to its birthplace, New York Sub-Treasury Building, where Congress first adopted the amendments. The document becomes the focal point of the fourth war loan drive. This is one of the original copies of the bill, and it is loaned to Mark Van Doren, committee chairman. It is my great privilege as chairman of the National Book and Author War Bond Committee to accept the loan of this priceless document, the Bill of Rights, as a foundation for our activities during the Fourth War Loan. This engrossment of the Bill of Rights will in due time be presented to the Library of Congress. Meanwhile, it has been loaned to our Book and Author Committee through the generosity of the donor, Mr. Battleban. The goal of the fourth war loan drive is $14 billion. The Bill of Rights, after the drive is concluded, will be presented to the Library of Congress. This is the only basic American document not in the library's possession. Now the ancient parchment will be enshrined alongside the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. It was in 1791 that the Bill of Rights was drafted to safeguard the rights of the states and of the people. The Charter of America's Freedom, the Bill of Rights. Twenty-five thousand tons of oceanic air power, and the new carrier is christened the Hancock. <laughs> Named after John Hancock of Revolutionary War fame, this ninety-six million dollar aircraft carrier at Quincy, Massachusetts, was paid for with money invested in war bonds. Times Square, New York. America launches a great Fifth War Loan offensive for a record $16 billion. A giant cash register records the daily bond sales for New York State, and the first day's buyers responding to the great invasion news establish an $18 million beachhead on the city's $4 billion objective. In Washington, Mrs. Charles Clark, mother of the Fifth Army General, buys a Fifth War Loan bond and dedicates it to her fighting son, General Mark Clark. Back in New York, a stirring Fifth War Loan parade up Fifth Avenue. Today, the eyes of the whole world are on our armed forces. As they dig in on the French coast, we must and will dig down for that extra bond. Then in Central Park, real evidence of where our money goes. A big gun, $20,000 anti-tank gun, $6,000, heavy machine gun, $1,200. And from the White House, President Roosevelt with a message to the American people. There is a direct connection between the bonds that you have bought and the stream of men and equipment now rushing over the English Channel for the liberation of Europe. There is a direct connection between your war bonds and every part of this global war today. The liberation forces that are now streaming across the channel and up the beaches and down through the fields and the forests of France are using thousands and thousands of planes and ships and tanks and heavy guns. They are carrying with them many thousands of items needed for that dangerous, stupendous undertaking. And today there is a shortage of nothing, nothing. And everyone who bought a war bond helped, and helped mightily. And so I, I urge all Americans to buy war bonds without stint, swell the mighty chorus to bring us nearer to victory.
takes our Kenna, USA, which straddles the border of Texas and Arkansas, fires the opening gun in the nation's fifth war loan campaign for 16 billion. This arsenal town of the Southwest is host to Governor Coke Stevens of Texas and Pipe, and many notables from all parts of the country. The young Universal star, Gloria Jean, is among Hollywood's representatives. Texarkana topped its quota. New York inaugurates its drive with a parade by the 100th Infantry. With Americans storming the beaches of France, every day is D-Day on the home front. Buy that bond, back their attack. <laughs> The Treasury Department LCT, the Blue Star, climaxes a bond-selling tour as she arrives in New York to take part in liberation ceremonies at the Statue of Liberty. America at War has a special significance to these people of various nationalities whose native lands are being liberated through the sale of America's war bonds. Let's all follow this patriot's example. Buy bonds and put them away to guard our most precious heritage, Liberty. Portland, Oregon, and the launching of Swan Island Shipyard's 75th tanker, the SS Forbes Road. On hand to wield the christening bottle is Mrs. Ted R. Gamble, wife of the National Director of the Fifth War Loan Drive. A tense moment. The 16,800 ton tanker takes its name from the main highway used by the Forbes expedition across western Pennsylvania in 1758. For 30 years, Forbes Road was used as the main highway between the east and the Ohio Valley. Now the name goes out on the high seas. One more ship to hasten victory. One more example of what happens to the money from your war bonds. Good luck to the Forbes Road and keep the ships coming by backing the Fighting Fifth. It's the avenue of the Allies now, no longer just Fifth Avenue. Secretary of the Treasurer Morgenthau and Mayor LaGuardia make it official in a symbolic tape cutting. And along the famous boulevard, the flags of the United Nations now proudly fly. Let those flags remind you that this is a fight for a free world. The least you can do to help win that fight is to buy Fifth War Loan Bonds now. The Fifth War Loan Campaign gets underway in Milwaukee. Rear Admiral A.S. Carpenter, commander of the 9th Naval District, welcomed by Badger State's War Activities Committee as the Navy War Bond Exposition opens to a crowd of over 100,000. Rousing rally on the home front, backing the boys on the beachhead. Admiral Carpenter tells of the tasks ahead for all Americans before victory can be completely won. Shooting off a handsome thoroughbred at a war bond rally at Indianapolis, Indiana. A colt named after Gene Crane, a starlet in the motion picture, home in Indiana. Who will be the highest bidder and get the colt? Why, Vigo County, with war bond purchases of five and a half million. And there's Gene Crane and Governor Schricker. Mr. Van Orman, on behalf of the Indiana Finance Committee, I'm very proud to present to you this fine filly, Gene Crane, which represents uh, the winning of Vigo County for having purchased the most war bonds at this auction sale tonight. Uh, the bids of Vigo County were in excess of $5 million, and we're very proud indeed of that fine record. The colt seems highly pleased. <laughs> Thanks for bringing in all that money for war bonds. Vice President Wallace, Treasury Secretary Morgenthau, and Vice President-elect Truman. It's a pleasure, Mr. Secretary, to participate in the sixth war loan drive. I hope you put the Series E over the top this time. Thanks. I've got the money. Oh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I have the world's best investment. Well, you bet you have. 
President Roosevelt urges the nation to buy bonds. The war in this present month of November, in November alone, will cost us seven and one half billions of dollars. That is two hundred and fifty million dollars a day. And that is why every war bond that you buy is so important. We can all practice self-denial. We can all sacrifice some of our comforts to the needs of the men in the services. There's an old saying about sticking to the plow until you have reached the end of the furrow. Every rule of common sense and patriotic thought makes that maxim applicable to our conduct of the rest of the war. In the name of our wounded and sick, in the name of our dead, and in the name of future generations of Americans, I ask you to plow out that furrow to a successful and victorious end. Your war bonds in action. Your money, men, and material in a new super offensive to drive the Nazi legions back to the River Rhine. And here in Hertgen Forest on German soil, anti-aircraft batteries in the strange role of field artillery. The reason? No Nazi planes to shoot at, so they shoot at Nazi troops. night, the Western Front now rocks with an average of two allied tons of shells every minute. Ammunition that your war bonds must keep replaced. Just behind their own barrage in Hurtgen Forest, the infantry bivouacs, waiting for the word to move up. Then it comes, and through the woods, just raked by artillery and air power, the infantry in coordinated attack stalking whatever Nazis may remain alive to fight. Nazi machine gun ahead, hit the dirt. The day's bag of prisoners in Hurtgen Forest, typical of a German army being hammered to pieces along a 400 mile front by six Allied armies. The British second, the American ninth, first, third, and seventh, and the French first. And now on the Western Front, a new foe, winter. Blizzards that add to the ordeal that Allied soldiers bravely bear. But no sacrifice can stop them in their iron determination to smash the Nazi war machine and come home. You can speed that day and ease their trials by investing extra money in America's sixth war loan drive. Get on the buying line and back up the firing line. You owe it to these men, your gallant fighting Yanks. 